proud for our speaker this afternoon. I'm Bill Brenner. I'm president of the museum board. And most of you probably know that by now anyway. But uh, welcome to all of you. Um, one housekeeping, I don't know if I call it housekeeping or not, but wanted to let you all know that, and you may have seen the sign downstairs, but the Brown sisters are going to be here again this year. Uh, and they'll be out at the 4 H Center on September the 24th. And we have tickets, if anybody wants to purchase them today, uh, they'll be available downstairs. Uh, they put on a real good show, uh, certainly if you like that kind of music. And they do a great job. So uh, any of you that want to attend and want to buy tickets, well, we've got them for you today, if you so choose. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Mark Browning, I just met him, so I don't have a lot of detailed information, uh, but that'll make the introduction a lot shorter and sweeter. Uh, he indicated to me that he was in the, he's retired from the Navy, but he was in the Navy or the Reserve for uh, 24 years. I personally won't hold that against him. I was in the Army, but uh, we all have our branches. So um, anyway, it's great to have him here. He's currently the chairman of the World War II Museum uh, down in Evansville, and he's going to talk to us today about uh, World War II and, and the, and the tri-state area. So at this point, I give you Dr. Brown. Good morning, or afternoon. How are all of you today? Thank you for coming. Appreciate that. My wife's in the third row. She said she'd get here early. She did. She got here two minutes ahead of time. It is early for her. What? JFK said about his wife, she's always late, but she sure looks better. Okay, uh, I'm going to go over a couple of things with you. This is our talk today. It's Evansville, but it's also the Tri-State area during World War II. Um, but I want to show you a couple of things because this is the Boonville Museum and I want to show you something about um, about a couple things I also been working with Browning genealogy uh, most of my life my dad did it and so I've inherited it with my three sisters but we have a couple sites here this is free to the public and down on the lower off site we put this on about a year ago uh, this says Warwick County Orphans Home, and um, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, Warwick County, you say about the lady of Virginia Aldridge, she put that all together. The address is 217 South, or First Green, First Stream in Boonville, Indiana. So it was about above the McDonald's there, near where uh, uh, Sheila's, uh, the pole lines place were, okay? And I'll uh, just show you one thing on it here, but you can go to the website for free and you look at, um, this is the old home itself. I'm going to double click, it should open it up. That's the old home itself, and so, so you might remember it, but there's a famous doctor in Amazon named Ray Nicholson. He had a, he was a, uh, he worked in a, uh, a produce place before, Nicholson produce but before that, and then he became a doctor, but his, uh, family, his grandfather lived at this orphanage for a while. So I think you might like to, you probably find some relatives there or something of some sort uh, that Mark, might, you know. Mark, Mark the screen's right behind in your head. I don't know if I'll fix it. Thank you for telling me. I can move. Okay. Okay, the changes now I'm in his place. Well, I think you can still see the screen. Can you see the screen now? Okay. That screen's got a little bit on it. I don't know. My, my partners see that and it drives them crazy. That's got a few, that's a little active, okay? But I just go one other thing I wanted to show you. There's a lady that helped us here. We had to go in the, your state building over there, that county building over there. And we did all the immigration records. Now, they wouldn't let me photograph them and scan them but we did enter everything. So if you go into our website and go to, can you see now? Are you, can you see okay? But um, it's called the um, Immigration Database. Um, 
And we got, uh, I think about, I think 1,800 records in there, but we got a, eight or 900 from Warwick County. And the immigration records went from 1887 to about 1920. So all those records went off to Indianapolis, and you're probably never gonna see them again, but we tried to scan them here, and the uh, person wouldn't let me scan them, but we did index them. I'll just show you one, one let's just put the word Smith here. But they cover both Vandenberg and, uh, so I put the word Smith and we search. And it's very interesting, and we're gonna put all the images up. We were allowed to scan or copy all the Vandenberg ones, but these are all the names from Scotland, Germany, France, and then here's some from Prussia. So I just put his up there. It's Frank, this is Vandenberg County, but the very top line could end up Warwick County. And so he came uh, from Prussia, arrived through New Orleans, and then it uh, went, it says he appeared before the Warwick County clerk, 9661, 1861. He was 26 years old. He renounced the Frederick William King of Prussia. So this was a Warwick County person, even though we got the county up on top of this. But I think that would be, you know, your, uh, Warwick County people. I think that's that's a sidelight. I just wanted to show you that's all available to you for free. I know this is a very enjoyable slide I got there. There, now we're going to get off that. Let's see if I can find where I'm supposed to be. Hmm. What happened to it? There, it's down there. All right, there we go. Now let's start here. Now, what time you got, my Jennifer? It is 107. Okay, it's 107. Okay, this is Boonville Museum. I met uh, some of your people probably 10 years ago. We had a museum coalition at our museum, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago, and we had about uh, 30 museums from southwestern Indiana represented, some from Illinois, but we met your people here, and I didn't know much about that, but you were probably the friendliest of all the museums. So um, I think it's important that the museums work together, and we'd like to work more together with you. Uh, this is Evansville. And Evansville really represents uh, uh, Warwick County a lot. Um, these are just jobs. And uh, when I went, I went around your uh, courthouse today, and when you look at deaths from World War One, and you look at World War Two deaths, Vietnam, and also Korea, I could multiply it by three or four, and you would get to our numbers in Vanderbilt County. So you're just about a third in regards to most deaths, and probably percentage of soldiers, but all of them are one-third across the board when I look at our numbers. But then, what happened World War II? I started doing this in 19, or in 2005, 2005 because my father, I was called to go to a church to give a talk with Tom Howe, who was a World War II veteran, a guy named Woody Woodall. He was the uh, head of our postal system, and then my father. And so they told their experiences, but then we wanted to put it in perspective. So I had to go do all this study and put it all in perspective. They told great stories. And on that site that I just showed you on the internet, you can go to a YouTube site, and I've tried to video. We've got about 300 soldiers, World War II, Korea, uh, and talking to them, giving their story. If you go there, I have Mr. Guren, Guren. He was a principal here. I have him on there twice. I went to his house and beat him. He was a CB in World War II. Uh, he just died a year or two ago. And then we had him speak at our museum. Uh, he helped put marts and mats. Uh, marts and mats are a piece of steel that's about 20 feet long, about 18 inches wide. Because when you land at your planes, if you land them in mud or in inclement weather, they would sink down and turn over. So these marts and mats, we made a whole airport about two days right now it takes about 10 years to make an airport but they would make the whole airport and he was one of those he was a cb and uh there's other things on cbs but cbs were the construction people in world war ii and it was invented about 1942 but once you conquer then you have to establish your water system your electrical system your roads your airports everything else so mr Gurren was really big in that and there's many other people like that the average troop in 1942 in World War II, average age was about 18. Of the Seabees, they were 37. They would just go take a whole construction company like Skanska or something, take them, you're all in the Army, because they wanted senior people to create things. And so when you listen to Mr. Gurren's notes, he was young then, but most of the guys were senior. They'd take a whole construction company and put them in the Army. Because they, once they got there, you had to do things or you were just toast. So anyway, this is, when you look at the left upper, it says manufacturing jobs in Evansville. 
18,000 and a population of 97,000. Uh, not a whole lot at that time manufacturing jobs. So I'm going to show you on the next slide what it changed to just in a two or three year period of time. Unemployment across the country in the recession was about 10 to 15 percent. In 08, we suffered an un unemployment rate of about 10 to 11 percent, and we were all crying. And we had it one or two years. They had it that stretched for a decade. And you don't think it was hard. Your parents, grandparents grew up during that time, and they never spent any money, most of them, because they grew, through, grew up during that time. They might have spent some money. So we were able to lose more jobs in 42. So actually, I keep studying, and I can't really find the real reason why we got so much business in regards to military contracts in World War II. But one of them was our mayor. He's about 6'4", mayor dress. Dress Memorial Airport, Dress Plaza. He was a tall guy, but he was a good negotiator. There's another guy named Bainey. He was our congressman from uh, Vanderburg County. And then there was a couple other people, a guy named Ruthenberg that was in charge of Surveil. And I'll tell you in a minute how I think he influenced things a lot. Um, then Walter Cook and the president of, United, uh, of International Steel. But this is the biggest, one of the biggest labor libraries in the whole country right here in Boonville. So you really know a lot about labor here. I go to the Labor Labor Day Parade, which is big. It's big because mostly because of coal mines. But if you can't marry labor and management in the government, you don't make things happen. I am still absolutely amazed about World War II of how all those things married and how we got so many things done. So this went to the same okay. This is um, this is what happened in well, this is the jobs. Oh, in any case, these jobs, those jobs up in late, I don't have the slide there, but the jobs moved from 18,000 to 80,000. Okay, 80,000. And the population moved up to 150,000. That's what happened. I don't have a slide on that, but that's what happened. So, <clears throat> manufacturing jobs, 80,000. I'm just telling you, it was, we were the biggest per capita manufacturing population city in the world in World War II compared to Germany, anybody in the United States. Now, the biggest per capita working population for the war effort anywhere in the world. That's what happened. And a lot of people from Boonville, a lot of people from Hatfield, they get on the buses and come over and stay all week. Sometimes they'd do a hot bed where they'd stay in somebody's house for the week and then come back. You couldn't have your own car. You had to go on a bus. You couldn't have to afford gas because they wouldn't give you gas two months. People from all around. It was a social change. I'm saying that I, I'll tell you again, population moved from 97 to 150,000. It's a social change. Social change meaning all these people came from Kentucky, Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana, from over here, even uh, east of here. And then a lot of them stayed because of inertia after the war. So it made a big difference in life. And so I talked to so many people that, well, why'd you come here? Well, my parents got a job. Now, if you have 50,000 people, new people, where are we going to put them? It was a social nightmare. These are yellow buildings in Evansville. The yellow ones are where we made little apartments for them. 18,000 rooms, 1,800 places when you had that. 1,800. Now, 1,800 from 50,000, you still got 48,000 people. Where are you going to put them? So, hot bedding was a common thing. Hot beds were I'd stay in a bed in somebody's house, and I'd sleep there for 10 hours, then I'd go to work, and then somebody else would get in that bed, and the bed was still hot, and it, had, it didn't cool off. That's why you call it hot bedding, because it'd still be hot. And then the next person would come, and they would rotate beds, because you had to put 48,000 people somewhere, and, they, and these are the apartments they had. Those apartments were supposed to be made for about five years. They're all still standing. They didn't get torn down, so they weren't made of the best construction, but they're all still there. But that's what happened. Now, the red things are major industries that were created in, in Evansville at that time. So uh, the one on the bottom right is Cervell. Cervell, your grandparents had a refrigerator, and we just got a refrigerator yesterday. My, my grandfather always had his live in his kitchen. One moving part made it Cervell. It was made by, and, and, you know, the, the door would open. That was it. And it was made, gas would, you know, help the, the gas would help generate to make the cooling. Now, everybody threw those out. They're real heavy and big and bulky, not easy to move. 
And now, if you go to the Mideast, that's the same thing they use right now. The troops use it because you don't have electricity over there, but you have gas. You just, it's a gas uh, refrigerator. So Cervell was big. They got what you call 5E awards. They made bullets. They made wings to the plane. They made all kinds of things. Up above that is Chrysler Ordnance. If you look up there, about right, well, I don't have a pointer, but it says Chrysler Ordnance on the top, top right. And then over there it said bullet loading. We made bullets there in Evansville. And I will show you in a minute, but we made up um, 3 billion 45 bullets. Now 3 billion, you don't even know what 3 billion is. I don't know what 3 billion is, but a bullet, a 45 bullet is about the half size of your pinky. If you take that bullet and go around the world, you can go around the world three times. It's 75,000 miles of bullets. They were made in about two and a half years, mostly by women in this factory. We never made a bullet before. Walter Chrysler, they said, Walter, can you make some bullets? Oh, yeah. He had the ego bigger in this building. <laughs> <laughs> he might have a big ego. He did produce. And we ran out of brass is better for a bullet. We ran out of brass. So he had to make it out of steel. And the expansion was not good. We had metallurgists studying that. But... It was just amazing. We never made a bullet in our life, and all of a sudden we made all those bullets. 96% of the 45 bullets made in World War II. Now, if you look over here, well, right in the very middle, right in the very middle is International Steel. Now, International Steel makes those round, round things at the hotels, those big round, the round, in the hotel, you used to go in a hotel and they'd be a round door that would circle round, round, round. They're revolving. famous for, what's that called? Revolving. Okay, revolving door, that's right. A revolving door, that's what you call it. Thank you. Okay, so they made a revolving doors. I think they, the building is still there. Some techie, our guy from Barry Plastics, he put his son up in there. And so Walter Cook uh, was just interviewed there, the son of the real Walter Cook. But what happened to International Steel? We had two steel companies, and that was Omesco Steel and International Steel. They weren't doing a whole lot, but all of a sudden, International Steel, uh, he said, we'll make the things for the bolts and make the steel to make Whirlpool or Republic Aviation that time. So they made the, the steel for the for the LSTs. Never made, we never made an LST before either. Missouri Bridge and Valley came down and we made 167 LSTs over on the river, uh, more than anywhere else in the United States. 1,100 were made in World War II. 7,000 ships were at D-Day. There's only one left floating in the world. It's right there in Evans, so it's the LST. Um, we made 167, 11 are made. We made more than any other place in the United States. They're actually absolutely an amazing ship. My dad was on for four years in World War II, so I've heard the lecture probably a thousand times. It's actually an interesting lecture. If you look at uh, this over in the bottom corner over Hercules, Hercules is way over there in Bucyrus Erie and the shipyard points over on the left. So we'll show you some examples of what they made at these things. But if you look at Hercules, it was had 30,000 employees at the turn of the 1900s in Evansville and in Henderson. They made buggies, they made bicycles, and all of a sudden those got out of vote. But they also, if you had a woody car, a car with that wood on the side, they made the panels on the side, and they kept making those all the way to the 60s and 70s. And they made lorries for World War II. But Hercules was a big manufacturer. Be Cyrus Erie, my grandmother worked there. We still have reunions. They closed in 1984. They had three plants. They were one of the one, the biggest one to help make the Panama Canal in 1914. Biggest construction thing ever, uh, ever the uh, biggest engineering feat of the night of the 20th century. But it was a lot done by Bucyrus here. Big plant. Still, the building still exists on the west side of Evansville. During World War II, made shovels, made things. They made what you call. Uh, drag lines. So that was big in Boonville. Now what won World War II is the industrial infrastructure. And you don't have an industrial infrastructure if you don't have coal. And so Boonville supplied a lot of coal. Warren County was a coal mining capital around here. So none of these plants I'm talking about would work if you had coal. So if you Cyrus helped make back holes, um, or back, not back holes, but uh, uh, draggers, what they call them? Yeah, Put on dragon, thank you. Oh, yeah, dragon, dragon. So they made those things, medium, uh, big size, and so you, some of you, your families work with Bucyrus here. 
there's Shane Uniform up there, Boots, and there's Hoosier Cardinal. So I want to show you Hoosier Cardinal there. Hoosier Cardinal is that red dot about in the center. Now Hoosier Cardinal, if you go over First Avenue in Evansville, uh, there's a guy named Tom Martin, and he died, I don't know, 70s or 80s, and his uh, son died in 2010. But Thomas Martin is the father of plastics. Father of plastics. Now, this tri-state area is called the plastic capital of the world. We got plastics everywhere. Salve, Barry, all kinds of places make plastic. Well, this guy went and learned how to do um, plastic things from Germany in the 30s. He brought it, that technology over and uh, injection molding, he learned how to do that. And so the bubble top I'm gonna to show you on the P47, he helped make the bubble top. Also the bubble top are some of the bubble things on the B-24 and other planes in World War II, right out of Evansville, we made this plastic. So it's amazing that we have all these things happen in this little town, this little tri-city area. We had a river, we had an airport, we had trains, we had good highways, those things happened. But if you look back in the 30s, the infrastructure of the United States was created a lot with the WPA. If you look what the WPA did with Angel Mounds, you look what the WPA did with our infrastructure of making, helping the electricity better, helping the waterways better, made a lot of the dams, you look at the dams, made the Newburgh Dam was 29 to 32 dams, up and down the Ohio, everything. The WPA, a lot of things really happened in the 30s to help us transport all this industrial miracle that happened in the United States. Now this was High Street, this was the red light district in Evansville, so it was very popular. High school kids would drive by there and smile and laugh, but we had one policeman that managed all that. And we had 50,000 new people, you don't think there was a problem there? <laughs> so here's the three big factories. Now, Evansville had 80 factories, 330 products, these are the main ones. Never made any of these things before, and all of a sudden we made them. The ingenuity in a three to four year period of time, I am still absolutely amazed what we did for the war effort. You know, when the federal government says do it, and everybody got behind it, they did it. If you look at the 34,000 workers, actually out of Republic Aviation, there were only 7,000 under the roof, but they had to have suppliers. If you go look at Toyota, it's got 5,000 employees, but it's got probably 10 or 15,000 suppliers. The so same with the P-47. You had to make all the parts before you put them in. LST, we had the plant downtown, 21,000 workers. Okay, the biggest plant right now, if you look, the two hospitals have about 5,000 employees each. Toyota has 5,000. Those are our biggest employees. Look at this, 21,000 down at one place. Just crazy. I mean, how could you manage all that? 21,000 employees, you know, I don't know, we got probably 30,000 people in Boomer, so everybody in Boomer working there. You know. Bullet workers, 16,000. And I really want to compliment Chrysler because they got, they brought industry to Evansville, and that's a little bit what brought this here, is Chrysler brought, Chrysler started making Plymouth Dodges in 1935 in Evansville. And if they wouldn't have done that, wouldn't have proven to the world or proven to during World War II that we could be an industrial infrastructure. Now, these are Army, Navy, E awards. We got in the Evansville area, Tri-State area, 41 of those, more than most cities across the country. You got an E award, they graded you on about seven things to see if you did good work at your factory. If you did good work, you got an E award. Only 5% of factories got an E award, and we got tons of E awards. You got the flag, you hang it around, or you put it on your lapel, but you were pretty proud of that. That top part's on the lapel. We've got a bunch of those at the museum. And you look at our museum logo, it's made, the logo's made like an E award. And those are primary colors in that logo. And the logo has bullets, which we made a lot of. It has a tank, has a plane, and it has an LST. That's why our logo's there. And those are the primary colors that were used in World War II. Shipyard only got three uh, Navy E awards, got three stars, 167 LSTs. Took about 60 days to make one when we should really got good at it from beginning to end, and then about 10 days to outfit it. After it got outfitted, we pushed out ri river and then ran up down the, the, uh, the river and checked it and then sent it down to New Orleans. No troops came here. It was already crazy and nothing. We didn't have any troops here. My dad got on the LST when he got to New Orleans. If you look at this, this is the big ways. They were going to get this contract in Paducah, and somehow we got an episode. Paducah's 
water level was a little bit lower and also they had less acreage than we had. So we got this, there's a lot of shanties there and they just by eminent domain took over. That's Wright's High School up on the top with the big smokestack. And this is what these look like. The cranes all went by hand signal. We have one crane left. It's down there about by the old Sigaco building. If you look, we have one crane left, but we had those cranes working. It was 24 seven that these things worked. And a lot, you could see the lights about halfway across heaven. So this is what it looked like. It, you had to get checked. Those looks like Robert Stadium when you go to a basketball game. Those little houses, you had to get your ID checked, make sure you weren't a spy and everything else was all right. Look at this. This is, this is you know, so 7,000 shift, you've got 21,000 people there. This is a nut house. This is what it looked like. After you got done with the ships, you push them down in the water. You look at a lot of these smokestacks on that first ship closest to you. Uh, Cook, Cook Company helped make those because you had to get good ventilation because we had 15 Sherman tanks in the bottom. You'd die of carbon monoxide unless you ventilated it well. After they got done with it, then they put it down in the water. You see some of those in the water, about six in the water. Then you outfit it like you get your house made, and then you do your wallpaper and other things. They had to do the inside part of it. Then when that got done, then they floated up the rivers to make sure it was ever, everything was all right. If you go to a power plant now, I've got a lot of patients go to power plants and work out and they weld. You have to x-ray everything they weld to make sure it's right. Tons of inspectors, because if those pipes break, they got a problem, especially a nuclear plant. Nobody x-rayed any of these, but there were very few malfunctioning uh, LSTs. So the women, a lot of them were uh, I had one patient, she was up here from Newport, or up here from uh, Boonville, and she was a welder. If she worked in a restaurant, she could actually close to triple her pay from a restaurant to being a welder, sometimes being a rosary. So a lot of the women moved to there. This is when daycare started, because you had all these babies floating around, and these women made all this money at these factories. So they moved into the factories, and they had either grandparents, take kids, or a big daycare started at this time. This is a on the right, it's a brooming thing. On the left, it's uh, breaking the champagne. Now that champagne bottle is in a bag, and I always thought that but glass broke everywhere, but it didn't break. It, it break, but then it, I, it, it was protected in that little bag. We've got one of those in the museum, and you get roses, and you get a big silver bowl, and we've got all that. That's what it looked like, one of those christenings. Look at the people. They're coming out like much at ants. This is the fantastic thing about an LST. This is, uh, you know, uh, coming out the front, uh, Higgins Bolt, but this is a uh, Higgins Bolt we carried. They made 20,000 World War II, but this is what D-Day looked like. D-Day looked like, so uh, Churchill said when Dunkirk happened, that movie came out recently, 1939, Churchill said, if you don't get men and machines on the land, you're not going to win this war. And that happened in 39. These ships were created down, they were used them down in Venezuela, something like it. The front doors didn't work as well down in Venezuela, and we made changes in it. And a submariner helped make it because it got ballast and lifted up and down. But the LST is a fabulous ship. We, I think it won the war, but everybody, a little bit of everything won the war. But that great big whale sitting on that, on that uh, land there, what happens, it comes in on high tide, and then the tide goes out, and you're a sitting duck for 24 hours. And when the tide comes back in, then the ship goes back out. So the front of the ship opens like a big whale's open its mouth, and you take 15 Sherman takes out, and then you uh, fill it up with prisoners or fill it up with nothing, go back to London and get some more goods and come back. That's how we transport a lot of things on D-Day. This also was used on the biggest amphibious invasion ever, and that was in Okinawa. My dad was on that. But this worked a lot better because these be beaches were just right for it. The, the tide was changed 17, different, 17 feet that day. 4,000 plus men were killed the very first uh, 12 hours of that. It's a terrible time. This is what it looks like. LST, so this is some prisoners coming off. And this is 325. This is one we have in Evans, the only one left in the world. That's one of the, uh, uh, whatever what do you call those, cranes. And there's the only thing left from the shipyard. Burnt in 1956. Now, I'm moving to another important part. This is the P-47 factory, okay? This is called Republic Aviation. I used to go to a guy named Ken Wilson. He worked out here in Alcoa all his life, and he was a draftsman, but he was a P-47 nut. I mean, I've never seen anybody knew more about P-47. I might go to his base, he would never let me tape recorder, but I would sit and just listen to him, and he would go on and on. He had file cabinets, about 10 of them, this big. He knew what happened to every P-47 that we made in Evansville. 
where it went, what it did in its whole history. And he has a, a metal folder on every single thing. And all his records are in Chicago now. He donated for them, somebody to complete his book. And all those records are going to go back to a Willard Library. But it's fabulous what he did. He preserved that. And anytime I'd call it Republic something, he'd always correct me when I say Because what it says is Republic Aviation. That's what it was known for. And that's its symbol. If you work there, you can wear, wear a little symbol like that. That's Whirlpool, as you know it. It became Republic Aviation. Then it became, then it became uh, uh, International Harvester. And then it became Whirlpool. And now it's uh, Sugar Steel. But if you look right in the center, there's a little uh, sand hill right in the middle. That's where I'm going to show you that in a minute. That's where they, once they get to, the planes done, they would shoot the bullets in that hill. That's about where Sunset Sunset uh, uh, Cemetery is. And then there's one runway there. This is an aerial view. They started making it from the south. And we've gone into there, into the into Whirlpool, and some of that southern part is, didn't have the steel constructed yet. A lot of that's made of wood. But that's the southern border. And we just got the contract in, I think it was about March of 42. And this building was done before March, before 42 was over. If we did that today, it'd probably be 10 years before you got it done. But this is what it looked like, an aerial view. The top part, if you look, it looks like an airplane. That's the red building you see when you ride by Whirlpool. And that was the administration building. And my name, Halton, was a construction man. He has two windows in St. Benedict's Church. In memory of him, my aunt, Connie Browning, worked there for him in World War II. Now the amazing thing, this is a busy slide, but the first one on the left is a P-47. And these are three other fighter planes in World War II. The P-47 was very unique. He called it the Jub. But what I want to tell you is that the P-47 was air-cooled. All the others are water-cooled. So I'll go outside, and you probably, most of you drove here, and I'll put a bullet in your radiator, and your car is going to last about three or four miles, and it's no good. The same with these three other planes I've got, but they're all the other three were water cooled. Many other were water cooled, so they got a bullet in, they were toast. The P 47 would come back because it could take as many as 200 bullets. So it's an amazing machine, and it also carry about twice the weight. So it can carry bombs and missiles, lots of bullets. Some being refrigerators, this is a picture. We're going to have one in our museum shortly. And if you know where the Evansville Port is, that's where we used to carry the Chrysler's out onto the river. And that is still there. I got all the records. That building was opened in 1931. And you look at that, carrying that Chrysler or Dodge, and, and a couple barges sunk there on the bottom of the river. You want to salvage them, they're down there somewhere. <laughs> this is some of the bullets here. If you look at the bullets, and this is the 45 bullets I talked about. And you have the carbine bullets, the carbine used for the rifles. We made uh, only 500 million of those. And those are some of the rifles that were used for those bullets. These are the boxes on the bottom that we mailed them out to Europe on. And these are, a lot of these are blind ladies they are just feeling for defects. But just thinking, if, if one of you could make 100 bullets a minute, it'd take you from the Revolutionary War until now to get done. That's how many bullets were made at that time. This is what the tanks look like. And we just got a Sherman tank. Sherman tanks were made in World War II. They're not better than the Panzers. They're not better than the Russian tanks. They're not better than the other tanks, a little bit better than the Japanese tanks, but these tanks are 70,000 pounds, actually 67,000 pounds, because we've got a truck going to Texas right now and spring it here. It'll be here in about a week. We're going to have our grand uh, unveiling of it about June 30th. Yeah, they're 70,000, so if it rolls over your foot, your foot's gone. But uh, they weren't a lot better than the other, but that's how the United States, we had more and more and more and more. We had 78% of the natural resources, so we didn't have to go places to beg for things. We have a big image of this water tower that we're going to uh, have up the next week or two. They had 16 of these. The troops would take them out and, and break them, not on purpose, but practicing with them. And some came back from overseas. And we took the whole thing apart, put them back together. And that was a crisis. And we never had worked on those before. This is just an aerial view of that area. We also we made bullets, we did the tanks, and we made incendiary bombs. Incendiary bombs burnt Japan from February of 2045 all the way to May, and they still wouldn't give up. I'm going to just go over some other companies who were there. American Hark and Fork and Hold, they made axes and fork. And remember, every troop, every jeep, they had a, a, a fork and a hole, and so a lot of those things were made in Amazon. You look at the boots manufacturing, how boots 
he flew at B-25 and he flew about 18 missions, but Boots Factory is still there. Some of your relatives probably worked there. But when he was over in Italy, he said, I saw some of those kitchens coming down in the, in the uh, parachute. So uh, uh, made a lot of things for World War II. This is what it looked like. That was the head of Boots Manufacturing at that time. Briggs International made the real funny wing on the Corsair. It's like a, those are the wings when we made them there at uh, Briggs and made a lot of other wings for other planes of World War II. Bizarre's area, I talked about that already. The employees went up there as well, close to double. And there they are in the World War, over there in the Panama Canal on the left. If you meet, needed me, a lot of farmers didn't go to World War II because if they were a farmer, we need our bread basket. We need to make them uh, food. My grandmother worked at Fender Cigar. That's now Barry Plastics. It's a gigantic building. Uh, but the cigars weren't as popular in World War II as cigarettes. Cigarettes became popular then, and the cancer stick got popular until about now. Hercules, I talked about that from Henderson, but remember, one of our biggest companies in the whole tri-state, 30,000 employees at the turn of the century. The president of that was McCurdy. You heard of the McCurdy Hotel down there. And the vice president was a guy named Carson, William Carson. You heard of Camp Carson. You heard of Carson Center. That's who it's named after. And Ellis Carson, his son, flew the hump in World War II. And the hump is going from India to China. We had him from Evansville flying. I have a guy named Irv Levine. I brought him out to the museum. He's only 100. I couldn't find him one day. And he was in his backyard cutting the lawn. So I said, hey, Irv, you got to be here so I can find you. But Irv, I, and you don't get him to cut your lawn because he's not, I think he's going to do his own. He's only, he's going to 101, but he was over flying the hump. But he's one of our stars. Who's your cardinal? I talked about who's your cardinal, how part it is. I didn't even know who this Tom Martin was, but remember, plastics is so important. This is the star of it, and World War II became the star of it. After World War II, they would make your, your whole dashboard full of metal, but then all of a sudden, it's all plastic. Everything in that car is plastic, but the dashboard, your horn, a lot of that was metal parts until this plastic company came around. Hoss call, pretty important. They uh, transferred to gas generators, helped make machine tools, other things. International Steel, I talked about it. We've got the records from International Steel now. A guy named uh, Bill uh, Chase gave them to me. He's 82, and his dad was uh, John Wolfgang. He was the chief engineer at International Steel. He gave me the original blueprints of how they modified the original LST. So we have those records. Last week, somebody brought in, they owned Seamers Glass, but the maiden name was Boss something and they made the Bailey Bridges. And uh, Bailey Bridges are important. In war, what you do is blow up the ports and you blow up the bridges. So Bailey Bridges are made in Evansville, not all of them, but it's a bridge that will cross a river 500 feet long. How you do is you put a bunch of, make a bunch of steel that's portable and put like canoes under them, and you can make a whole bridge in a day, and it'll pull a tank across it. That was made in Evansville. And I went to Trockman, junkyard the other day and because they had extra these baby bridges they made their whole building out of the baby bridges and I've been looking for them for 10 years and they're right there at Trockman you go look it's all made of baby bridges so this is what a bridge looks like but the steel they put this together and I have a friend Jeff and I have a friend he's about 97 he went over that in a tank over the same river so those things will hold you up and it's like a bunch of canoes under it but the the troops can make those bridges on site me Johnson, big company, some of your relatives worked there, made Amagen for IV protein, also some other medication and food products. Cervell, I talked about, Mr. Ruthenberg, five stars. They did so many different things. Third Rail Henderson Marine, the Marine thing right down, it's near Pigeon Creek in Evansville, but made a lot of Marine products. They had to do all kinds of things to make sure all those ships and all the products got. I saw, I went in this building yesterday or last night, it's right across from Bossy Field, it's called, used to be Crawford Doors, but that was first, um, it was first, uh, 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 what do you make those casters, faultless caster, then it became I Camp Rubber, I Camp Rubber makes the rubber for your gas pedal and your brake, it's real tough rubber, but they made never split toilet seats, so you probably sat on a rubber toilet seat, and this school probably had rubber toilet seats, the Holman building had rubber toilet seats, and they got some rubber toilet seats left that I'm gonna get and they're gonna give them to me. But these rubber toilet seats, they don't get the splinters in your butt. 
case. So 34 industries, boys 1941, that's 94. So there, look at that, 78,000. Isn't that amazing? Look at that, look at the difference. Look at the difference. So that's where we got a donation. It cost 70,000 a guy, still living, his name's Jim Hitch. You heard of Hitch Scholarships, Ted Hitch is his brother. But he went to Central High School, and Central High School, Wrights tried it, Memorial tried it, Bossy tried it, nobody could do it. But these kids all got a hundred or seventy thousand dollars donated. Well, I know they they didn't have it. They got it from their parents or something. I guess the rich parents were central or something. But they got it and they called it Central Bear P47. And those are the kids that uh, they got a picture of them. So Maturity Journal. It's just this just summarizes Harold Morgan. He lives in um, over in Mount Vernon. His health is not good. But he grew up in a trailer with his dad was a supervisor at P47 plant. And he would go in every library. Every time I'd be going in the library, he'd be coming out because he'd been there all day. So he went to Willard, took pictures of everything they had, went to Evans Old Museum, everything they had because they got all of these records. And, they, and he went to uh, U of E library, got everything. And they put them in these books and described everything. It would be for him, a lot of this wouldn't be preserved. He'd still be sitting in the library, but he organized it in book format. He's got about six books. And uh, we've got 40,000 of his original photographs uh, very well scanned. But if you look at what happened in Evansville and in the tri-state area, it's absolutely amazing. And it's the biggest thing that ever happened in our lives or in our parents' lives was World War II. And this is what our mission is to try to tell our kids and make sure our kids know. We're open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 12 to 4. Uh, and this is what our P47, this is our jewel. got there in October a year and a half ago. It was real cheap but it still flies, and next to it's a Stearman. That's what the wing looks like with the bullets. The bullets, those are bullets the size of my finger. They're 50 caliber bullets. So when you pull the trigger, it takes 23 seconds to use all those bullets. And when you use them all, it's called, you. it's all nine yards. You heard the term all nine yards? That's where it comes from. All nine yards comes from these bullets being shot. So pull the bullets, 23 seconds are on. The power of that will turn over a locomotive, turn over a tank, very, very powerful. This thing's going three to 400 miles an hour. This is what the cockpit looks like. Now, this box here, I just got this today. That's only got, inside that's a gyro. Now, gyros, they help you fix the balance on the plane and know which, you're going, which way you're going in a the plane. There's two gyros in most planes, and that's a gyro. So, look at this cockpit. Look how much stuff's there. And that came in that big, but and that's an original. Look at the size of that. And you think how many parts to a plane? Five thousand parts to a plane. I'm doing it just because to show you. Look at the part of this cockpit. And you got to put all that together. And you and we made one plane every 2.5 hours. We made 10 planes a day. Henry Ford at Will Run made one every 63 minutes of B24. We weren't as fast as him. We never made a plane before. There were very few defectives. There's only three that crashed when the test turned out. So 6,200 plus we made. Look at all these parts. I'm just showing you that. And look at that container it came in. That thing's gigantic. You got all these parts coming. I would have, I would have left. <laughs> this is what our engine looks like. The engine's a 2,000 horsepower. Your horse, your horsepower in your car is about 200 horsepower. Thing weighs a ton. That's our image. And we got that little plane up in the air from Mr. They call him Tug. He's if you go out on Highway 64, he never made a thing in his life before. But I've been there every I put him on YouTube. He won't give us any more. He has 20 up there, but he gave us that one and we painted it, put it up there. But it's out on Highway 64 and they're all hanging up in the air. Yeah. He's got all kinds of, he never made them before, but they're all to scale. He's a tremendous artisan and his old garage is full of stuff. But he has about 10 left hanging, but his kids don't want to give the others up. We want to hang them around the museum, keep them up. But we got one of them. That's a P-47 to scale. We have a, a Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. This is the 100th anniversary of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier first started in 1921 because we didn't know who died. If you look at all our wars, mostly the Civil War, we don't know who half those people are or where they were. And so was 1.2 million soldiers died in all our wars. We probably don't know where 500,000 of them Two men on soldiers, we got an exhibit, we got it out from the Coliseum. It's from the 40 and 8. 40 and 8 is a group, just like the VFW, just like the American Legion. But there's three soldiers and then two unknown soldiers in Arlington. There's World War I, World War II, and um, a 
Korean War. There was a Vietnam War. They took it back out because they got the DNA. There's never going to be another two men unknown soldier because we've got enough DNA now. To, we got a War One exhibit. Look at the bottom there. That's a gold star. If you lost a relative in a war, you got to put that gold star out your out in front of your house. We lost. I lost my uncle in World War Two. My grandmother and my mother, my uncle, they never got over. You don't want to go to Star. Evansville had a guy named Gresham, James Bethel Gresham. He was the first gold star ever in the world. We didn't start doing that until World War I. And we've got that gold star. We all sat at his tombstone there. And if you look up there, we've got a little bit of the description of the flu of 1918. What do we got right now? COVID. The flu of 1918 killed more soldiers than the bullets did. So medical problems are a big problem in war. These are some of the guns. Those are all the flags of our allies there. This is, we have a big Vietnam exhibit. We have five different things with Vietnam. These are all Vietnam. 37 crafts were made in Evansville. Just, I uh, had a couple other pictures, but I can't find them now. Okay, I think uh, now I'll open it up to questions. Any questions you have? Yes, ma'am. Yes, with all the influx of people working, men and women, a great number, how were they fed? Because so many people were in the war, and we didn't have huge supermarkets and Okay, her question is how are the people fed? You're talking about the troops or us? Not just, just the workers. Just general. the workers here. So many workers. I've never been asked that question. I can only say that I know a lot of farmers that didn't go to war. They all felt self-conscious. If a man didn't go to war, he felt badly to some degree because he thought he should be out there. And then he felt everybody else was going. He should be there. It's usually a he. Um, but uh, they wouldn't take farmers. They wouldn't take farmers. So if we were the breadbasket of the world. Right now, we can export all kinds of things. We tell farmers not to do some things certain times, but I don't know that answer. I can only say that the farmers weren't taken to war and because they knew food was so important. I didn't know if the government shipped in to help feed the workers or, you know, I just didn't know. I haven't heard that the government had to do it. They had restaurants downtown. and the Red Cross, too. Red Cross was downtown. There's a Red Cross. If you go to the L N station and we have a Red Cross exhibit and they fed the troops. And most of the engines, train engines went by steam then, so they don't last, you know, fifty to hundred miles. So we had one point five million troops out of fifteen million troops showed up in Evansville because they all signed the, the sheet there. And they'd feed them for free and sew up their clothes and things. But what she's asking is a bigger question. I don't know, I guess the bread the world we got we had enough farming things in the United States. That was not our problem in the United States. Now, other countries had that problem, but we didn't have it as much as best I can say. Other questions? You, you yes, sir. You made the wings for the Corsairs in Evansville? You made, he asked the question, did you make the wings for the Corsairs? We made the wings for the Corsairs at Briggs. Where did they go then? Where were they assembled? I, I can't tell you for sure. I haven't studied the Corsair much. I can only tell you the Corsair was a fabulous machine on the wet end for the Pacific. It became real popular in the Pacific. If you look at the wing, first of all, the, the engine is the same as the P-47. It's a very strong, it's a 2,000 horsepower. But they had to sit it up high so that daggone prop wouldn't hit the ground. And the wings had to be in a little funny shape. Uh, you know, they put on the aircraft carrier and fold them up so you had more room. But uh, they really had a hard time at first with them. They had to catch them on the hook on that on the aircraft carrier, but they had a hard time because the plane sat like this, so when the pilot's coming in, he can't see the tank on aircraft carrier, so they had to snake in to come into the aircraft carrier. So they had a very hard time, but they finally figured out, you know, they, they had to look and then to get on that, catch that hook. You know, it wasn't easy, so of course they had a lot of problems, but they became a very popular, it's a very unique, a lot of people like it as their logo because it's a, it's a unique wing, like a, it, it bends up a little bit. But, but yeah, like a seagull, that's a good description. But they made it in so the, at, at Briggs. And I have one of my uh, classmates in high school, his parents worked there, so he always talked about Mr. Uh, oh, uh, who was it? It's my way, somebody. What else you got? Other questions? It, it just, uh, yes, ma'am. Did Germany know that Edwardsville was such an industrial park? Uh, their, their infrastructure in Germany, did they know the higher ups in Edwardsville is an important aspect? She's at, okay, this young lady asked some question about. Oh, did, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this, this teenager asked a question. So, <laughs> uh, uh, 
the, uh, the, the first of all, I'll try to answer it briefly. I'm not, you know, I'm not a history major. I hated history in high school. I hated it. But now I was I not like it for some reason. I don't know what happened to me, but something happened to me. Um, probably, probably, pretty late behind you, probably. Um, number one, there's a book about Bahala. Bahala, I think, means the word paradise or what it, something means, really. But that's where Hitler would go and live. And I got one patient gave me, he went up to Bahala about 1954, and they still had Hitler's bed up there. And his bed, and all that. So everything was gold. I mean, it was where he went and vacationed. But his girlfriend, his mistress, was Ava Brom. And Ava Brom had her, her best friend was a lady here in Evansville. I think they let her off on a submarine, and then she swam to shore. She was a world-class swimmer. She swam to shore, then she somehow got to Evansville. And, you know, she had a little bit of German accent. She speaking English pretty well. She lived above the Knotty Pine. This is called historical fiction, but a lot of it's true. She lived on top of the Knotty Pine. We tore that restaurant down. It's at Maine and... Heidelbacker or Maine and uh, Virginia, but she lived up on top of Naughty Pine and she would work, you know, she would go over to Henderson and then she'd swim from Henderson over on the other side of the river and, and go over to the uh, LST Pine and take photos and send them to Abe and Brown. So Hitler knew we had a problem here. He didn't like it here. He, if you look at some records, they say we were 17th on the hit list for Hitler because we had all this construction going. He didn't know what the LST was. You know, and she was talking about the bullet factory. She was telling about all kinds of things. So he knew this was a problem. And I had somebody that toured one of those big places over in Germany or in Vienna, and they said, and they found out this guy was from Evansville. He said, come back and look at this. And it had a big map, and it had a map, and it had Evansville, and yeah, it was in the German place on the hit list. So Hitler was hearing from his girlfriend about us, and, uh, they said we were 17 on the hit list. The size of our city, not city, but our city, we should have been about 200th on the hit list. But we were 17th on the hit list according to some authorities. And so we were 17th, they're gonna hit us. If they would have hit the Newburgh Dam and they knocked the dam out, the problem is then your ships don't go down. And the ones that they're making up in Jeffersonville don't go down, the ones that make up Pittsburgh don't go down. So you mess up three LSTs if they'd have bombed us. Now, we're gonna have a guy talk and we have a talk First Thursday of every every month out there, it's called the Swarka and uh, Senior Talk, and we get free lunch. You have to call my wife if you want a reservation for the lunch. But we have different talkers in um, in uh, um, um, December, the first Thursday of December. Got a guy come from Louisville to talk, and he's going to talk about our best ally. And who he's talking about is Hitler. Hitler made so many stupid mistakes. He was so a little bit crazy that he, that's the only reason we won. I mean, he could have pushed all those English that had Dunkirk into the water, and he had some reason backed off. There's so many mistakes. Why did he go to Russia? Why did he do this? Why did he do this? There's so many things. He's going to talk about that first weekend, that first Thursday of December. But um, Hitler knew a lot of things, but he was paranoid, too. He got They tried to kill him two or three times. You know, had bombs trying to kill him. So he was paranoid, fire his generals. Like that guy over in, in uh, Russia, that guy fired everybody. And he fired all his big generals. Uh, whoever was it, Salon or whatever it was. So he fired all his generals, fired all the generals. The top 80% were fired right away. Other questions? Okay, this is a fabulous topic, and I'm not an authority on it, but I'm a, I like our museum, and we want you to bring nephews, nieces, grandsons, grandkids out. We have, I didn't show a photograph of a simulator, but we have a simulator. We have four simulators. They're blind, they're world class, and you can learn how to fly. And you can't really fly with a license yet, but I'm telling you, they're world class or they're high class. Uh, so as the kids sit on them, and it's something to bring the kid out, and they like to do that. And then they learn something from the museum because what happens is, if if my dad tells me something, he tell me what his dad told him. So you push the time back, 50 to 60 years. If you get there, you tell the kid. The kids aren't going to listen to their parents, but they might listen to you. And they say, and then just say, do it for my birthday, do it for Father's Day, do it for something get them out there they get on the simulator but then also they'll hear some stories and if you look at theories of education a lot of them are getting from family and, and parents they learn more they act like they never listen but they do listen they do listen some but we need the next generation to learn this if we don't do this it's going to be gone and all this stuff i look at your museum is fabulous and if you get rid of all this stuff the kids are going to learn what they did in Boonville or Warwick County. It's, it's terrible. If I, I saw this stuff, it's just beautiful. You throw this stuff away, 
It's a sin. If this place burned, it's a sin. And you ought to photograph everything, digitize it, recreate it. I mean, if we have a fire, we got a problem. Everything a fire is a problem. A flood's a problem. So this is a beautiful museum. I've looked at it. My wife's going to look at it. It's just beautiful. You come out and bring some friends out and things, and we'll try to do some more work with you. You think of projects we can do together, it's always a win-win situation. Somehow, we do it together. You know, poor, we bring a portable exhibit here of some of our stuff. We're going to try to go with the LST this year. The LST goes to three different cities, get 30,000 visitors, 30,000. Somehow, this is part of it, where I would say Boonville is part of the industrial infrastructure because coal, it wouldn't happen without coal. And that's one of your main things. Now, you got a chicken thing down here, but I don't know if we had the chickens then. But that chicken, you make more eggs than anybody, or you got <laughs> eggs, or you got all these eggs here. I don't think it was that big in World War II, though. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for uh, listening and coming out. I got handouts here. I'm going to hand everyone, everyone these. These are ours and time. Yes. Yes, sir. I would say you said, uh, yeah, you made the statement you're not an expert, but I would say that if you ain't, you sure gave us a good snow job. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I definitely learned a bunch of stuff I never did. But we got a lot of people on the board. We got 50 on the board. We got about 50 volunteers. You can come out and be a volunteer. I'm telling you, these volunteers, I list these docents. We got one guy, he talked about Midway. And Midway was about a three day battle. And he spent an hour, he squished it all together. He's given the talk a hundred times. And, he gave it to us, and these guys listen to Midway. I mean, it was, and he's just a volunteer. And then uh, the other guy's going to talk about B-25 in two weeks. He's going to, his name's Michael Ross. He's going to talk to Doolittle Run about the B-25 because we've got a B-25 coming in the middle of July, and you can fly on and watch it and see what it is. Then in September, we got four planes. One of them's a B-29. And Nolan Gray was what dropped the atom bomb. And this is a Fifi. It's the only one left flying except for, no, there's no two of them left flying in the world. They're B-29s. They dropped the atom bomb. And... You know, I ask all my nurses, I ask my homie, well, when did you add a bomb drug? Well, 1960. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, I ask everybody in the hospital, when did they add a bomb drug? What year was that? And who did they drop it on? Ain't nobody know. And it, it has changed our civilization because of nuclear. We all be gone tomorrow. And people need to know that stuff in the hand of the wrong person is the wrong thing. Man, you might know when it dropped, but I'm telling you, these youngsters, they got they got to get uh, past that ice debt. But that didn't know in there. <laughs> I'm going to talk to Mr. Hundley. He worked right here. I'm going to tell Mr. Hundley, should talk about the bottom bomb. <laughs> yes. I wanted to bring up the Our Lunch and Learns because it is the first Thursday of every month. And we have a different speaker. And this all evolved because uh, Mark and a few of them had talked to a foundation who allowed... Uh, that wanted to help people of our generation learn more and more, and they wanted their grant money to go to this. So they pay for these lunches for us. It's a bronze team foundation. Bronze if you foundation. know the Solabron, so they own the Redbird station. If you know about the Redbirds, they own the Redbird stations. And so the Redbird station was Sol and Bernice, and they uh, uh, bronze They put Sol and bronze team together. But it's a bronze team foundation, and it's giving us some money for the lunches, but it's called Lunch and Learn. And you know, I'm not allowed to have any money unless I'm teaching somebody that's over 55. Yeah, has you can't have kids. You can't have any kids, no, we 55. normally run between 120 to 150 people every month. It's a fabulous, you know, there's a nice, there's a healthy sandwich. If he's deli, prepares it for us. There's a little salad and chips, but that's beside the point you get to eat. Uh, at, we have long tables. We had Zoom all talk, we had, the Rutherford talk, who was in, his dad was in charge of Cervell. Uh, we had three preachers talk last week, all very senior preachers talk about the experiences of war and what the, the PTSD and things of that sort. Uh, and Zumwalt was the head of the Navy when I was in. His son talked, and one of his sons died in lymphoma from Agent Orange, and Zumwalt pushed the bus for the Agent Orange. He had to live with the death of his one son, 1987, and he pushed the button for the orange. It, 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 
the Vietnam River was all full of bushes, and so everybody was shooting your, all these Navy ships going up down the river. And all of a sudden, the bushes were on, so we, the attrition rate went down to nothing. But his son was on one of those ships that got to Agent Orange, and so the other son talks about his anger and dealing with it, and how his dad dealt with it and things. But that was one talker. I'm telling you that the talkers are every one of us. For we got two coming up on Auschwitz. One lady going to talk on Auschwitz has done things on that, and. Uh, so we got great talkers. I just and, need to know, you know, and I say call call the museum. The museum's number is in the phone book, isn't it, Mark? Or on it's online. It's it's, I, online, it's on it's this online. thing. But I can't have a lunch without a name because the lunch is called Penny. But we, oh, that's, so that's, people are really good about calling okay. in, or if they can't make it the day before, they call, you know cancel the reservation. So it's very worthy, and some people have really come with their students of ladies or men, and they really, really enjoyed it. She knows 120 people by first name now. She's been she's been my RSVP for two for a year now, a year and a half. So she's getting to know everybody pretty well. But she's friendly, and she will give you service. Her phone number is Eric Gold eight one two four eight zero or no four four eight four five four three five four. But they can call the museum. Yeah, call the museum. Yeah, it's online. Okay, I really, uh, I want to work together. You guys can brainstorm, think a way to work together. You know, the Johnson that, uh, Foundation that gave you that carpet in there, gave you your elevator, they've given us a little money too. That carpet in there is beautiful. My gosh, I don't know if that's the prettiest carpet I've ever seen. It is gorgeous. You won't sell it? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just kidding. Okay, yes, one more. I'm just curious how many people in here had uh, relatives that worked in the war plant. Question is, how many people in here had relatives that worked in a work plant? Mine would have been a mother. It, it, it's called, what we have is lunch, learn, and share. And the third thing is share. It's so important that people stand up and tell stories about, well, we talked about Chrysler one day, about, about the bullet factory in Chrysler. We had 20 stories. And that... And they were better than the talker. And so, you know, they get up and say, my mom did this. And we've got to capture that stuff. It's so important to capture that verbal lore that I, I think is so important. And like a third of you raised your hands. My father-in-law, he was a farmer, like my husband was too. But he was taken at the end of the war. He was young at that time. But they took him and his other two brothers that had been farmers into the war and they let the one who was older, you know, too old, and he had never been a farmer, so he's the one that had to farm and give away food when he could. The one that the one that didn't farm. Uh, the one that didn't farm had to, to keep the family farm going because the other ones were younger and better shape. If you shape. if you talk to a gutty sergeant or any sergeant in World War Two they say, I'd take one farmer over 50 city boys. Mm -hmm. The reason is, is farmers improvise. Things are always broken, and you gotta fix it. The city boys will let me buy a new one. You, when you're in war, you can't buy anything new. The farmers are worth so much more, and they would we probably won the war faster if we had all the farmers out there. Because it, it just, and that's ironic why they took, they put the guys didn't know how to farm on a farm. I mean, there's logic there, isn't there? <laughs> My dad ran the yes and M bus line, drove the bus for the coal miners, picked them all up, they produced the coal. Yeah. They had to run a bus line because they had no gas rations to drive so, their own cars. So, so he said they drove they drove the coal mines, and actually they I talked, the and they're mine. packed, those buses were packed, yeah. and you had rubber, and there wasn't enough rubber, there wasn't enough gas, and they would, those buses were packed, and I've talked to people from Hatfield and Grandview, they were packed in those buses coming here to work, or to have to work, and the same thing here, everything, but I just, I, I, I'm telling you, my dad taught me to be a patriot. When I see all of this, you know, our country is so good, and you know what's good about it? The infrastructure, the infrastructure. You got, you got, why do people from India and China and all these other countries want to come here? Because you got good plumbing, you got phones at work, You've got good electricity. You've got everything. We, you have lived in the nicest civilization ever, and your freedoms until 9/11 happened. Your freedoms were amazing. Your next generation is going to have the freedoms we've got. But we have had. I, I don't think it's a total utopia, but it's sort of a utopia that you grew up in. You could do whatever you wanted. You want to go to California tomorrow? You go to California. Nobody. You don't have to talk to anybody. You just go. And, and you know these kids don't understand now. You know, I only understood when I went volunteer in India how nice we have it. But 
you know, in the military, I didn't learn that. Because they'd always pick nice ships and you'd be in a nice place, everything, you had everything. But until a kid goes to India or goes to China or goes somewhere and lives in a third world, just let them live there for a month. And they'll love this country. But they don't ever do it. It's out of sight, out of mind. And I don't know any other way. And every kid has to live on a farm for three months, too, and they learn what work is. <laughs> I mean, these kids don't know how to work. You know, work never ends. It just never it just starts. It never ends. Something's always got to be done. Uh, but anyway, that's that's it. Uh, any other questions? Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you.